Hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to the CRO event today. We appreciate everybody joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrassi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CRO Consortium with Environment and Profundo. Our focus today will be on fast-moving consumer goods companies and the risks they face from having deforestation in their supply chains. Fast-moving consumer goods companies had aimed to eliminate deforestation in their supply chains by 2020, but most are lagging in, in implementing and executing their zero deforestation policies. This exposes them to growing reputation risks as consumers, NGOs, and governments pressures them, pressure them to increase their ambition. Some consumer goods companies have recently reaffirmed their commitments to curbing deforestation, but their announcements also underscore the gaps between deforestation policies and their execution. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A function and we will aim to answer them after our presentation. Also, we'll put the presentation and the recording online afterward for, anyone, for everyone to read at their own convenience. And now I'd like to hand it over to Harard Reich of Profundo and Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment to begin the main presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Matt, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, why this study? Well, there are two important reasons for that and two more contextual issues um, concerning um, the first important reason is that, well, in the last few years, we saw continuing um, a recurring problem that there are many examples that fast moving consumer goods could still be linked to palm oil driven deforestation that despite the fact that they have deforestation commitments. And we have seen many examples of that in the chain reaction research. Um, uh, reports and chains. And also, when I spoke to a leading asset manager, he said, let's start executing instead of talking. And yeah, that brought, uh, brought, brought us to, 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 to start this uh, report. And also with the in, the in the context and the background of two other important points, that is that fast moving consumer goods position in the value chain um they generate uh quite a lot of profit on palm oil related products you can see here so many brands on the left side um and if you look to the top 25 users of uh, uh palm oil uh, uh, they uh, they use nine percent of the global palm oil production and they earn around 20 to 30 billion on this and i will come back later on this number. Also, uh, smallholders, they are facing a huge uh, 1.1 billion annual palm tree replanting need, and that creates deforestation risk. So also here, the, uh, the need to take action is, uh, is quite clear. Next slide, please. Uh, there are many studies. Uh, they continue to emphasize the leakage risk in the fast-moving consumer goods supply chain. Um, there is a st study of global uh, canopy. 40% uh, of, of the companies that, that, uh, that were researched have uh, no commitments on deforestation. And of all the companies, around 20%, only uh, 75 uh, they have uh, uh, commitments on a single commodity. So there is still an enormous gap. And also weak reporting uh, that is uh, in around 100 of the 210 which have commitments. So that is quite, uh, quite substantial. If we look to the WWF um, uh, Palm Oil Bio Scorecard, um, uh, 173 fast moving consumer good companies. Uh, if you look to the top 24 on which we focus in, in this report, uh, they had an average score of 14.1 out of 22. This, uh, this palm oil bio scorecard was very strongly focused on the execution in the supply chain. So that for the top 25 users of palm oil, 
only a score of 40.1. Then there was an OECD pilot project on responsible agricultural supply chains, uh, very much focused on the also on the execution and on the monitoring verification in three themes, environmental, labor rights, and tenure rights. And also here, the numbers um, are, yeah, it's on average, it's far below 50%. So also this again indicates uh, a weak uh, uh, execution and verification of, um, of, uh, of ESG policies. Uh, there is a fourth study by CDP uh, it was uh, it was made, and uh, if you look to the uh, number of companies that reply to CDP forest re requests, then 70% is not replying. So that's really an enormous number. So this gives gives a context, and it's good now to hand over to Chris for the facts and the challenges. Thanks, Harald. Hello, everyone. So yeah, I just wanted to um, explain a little bit about what we do, where our data comes from, and some of the challenges in the industry. Um, CRR focuses a lot on um, analysing deforestation, so identifying where deforestation is taking place, wherever it's taking place inside um, concessions, if it is, who is responsible for that deforestation, who do they supply to, and then what does that mean for the industry, for the companies looking at this market access risks, risk, financial risk, sustainability risk. And we've used a lot of that data in the report that Harad is going to talk about today. But we also use it to provide information on, on what the industry is looking like at the moment. And we every six months, we, we produce um, a publication on our CRR website um, showing you the amount of deforestation that has occurred in the previous six months. And I just wanted to sort of raise this today uh, this was a, um, a chart that we published in August, and it shows um, that in the first six months of 2020, um, there were almost 20,000 hectares of deforestation within known oil palm concessions in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Papua New Guinea. And just 10 companies were responsible for over 11,000 hectares of that. Um, and you can see those companies in the chart, and some of them will be um, recognizable to some of you. You've got you know, Salaidi, uh, a well-known Indonesian businessman who owns a collection of concessions in Kalimantan, is the largest deforester. And you've got an Indonesian company called Mulia Sawit, number two, Chiliangri Ankiabadi, number three. Um, so the reason that we're raising these issues is because there is still a huge amount of deforestation. You know, 20,000 hectares in a six-month period um, is still a significant number. Uh, next slide, please. And when you look at um, the supply chains that these companies appear in, it's a lot of the companies that have no deforestation policies, that have 2020 commitments to remove deforestation from their supply chains, that are sort of well-known companies in global markets. So if you take the case of Salaidi, the number one company, um, it's actually, there are no mills associated with Salaidi, but we have been able to track where they send some of their fruit bunches. And from linking the mill that's buying the fruit bunches to international supply chains, which we do via these public supply lists, you can see that some of these you know, well-known companies like Avon, Danon, Kellogg's, L'Oreal, Mondelez, Nestle, PepsiCo, Reckitt, Penkaiser, and Unilever, are still buying from um, you know, a mill associated with the largest deforester uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And then if you go down that list, you look at the second largest deforester, uh, Mulia Sawit. They're supplying to Avon, Danon, Kellogg's, Mondelez, Kofko, Itochu, and Unilever. And then again, the third, Chiliandri. You're seeing them in the supply chains of Avon, L'Oreal, Hershey, Itochu. Um, and a lot of other companies that were buying from uh, suppliers in the top 10 deforesters list. So Johnson & Johnson, General Mills, Mars, Procter & Gamble, Fusion Campina, PZ Cousins, Upfield, and then of course, several traders and refiners that are, are buying directly and, and sending this oil 
around the world. So there's still a huge issue of these companies, these consumer goods companies with no deforestation policies that still have deforestation linked companies in their supply chains. Next slide, please. So, I mean, Harad will talk about this a bit more, but there are lots of reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is that these supply chains are incredibly complex. Um, often you don't know who you're buying from, who owns a concession or a mill that you might be buying from. Um, and it's quite difficult to know what you're doing. So even a company with you know, the best will in the world that's really trying to implement a sustainability policy will struggle because of the lack of transparency in the industry. And that's something that we all deal with direct buyers, indirect buyers, NGOs, all stakeholders, we struggle with the lack of transparency. You also have this issue that um, the supply to consumer goods companies is most often indirect. They tend not to deal with the mill directly. They, would, they don't buy from the mill directly. So because they're quite far removed from the source, um, the, co the supply chain is a bit more complex, but it means that they will usually not deal with the, the mill themselves. They would be relying on their intermediary traders to screen the supply chain, to do the sort of due diligence work. Um, and that makes it quite hard because if you're a consumer goods company in Europe and you're linked to deforestation in Indonesia, you probably would have gone through a few different companies. And you won't know who the mill is, probably. You won't have a relationship with them. You won't probably be based in the same country. You won't speak the same language. So that does make it um, a little bit harder for the consumer goods companies to um, change things on the ground because they're relying on other people either doing it for them or in collaboration with them. You also have um, an issue that consumer goods companies will often be more reliant on palm kernel than on crude palm oil. And there are particular challenges in the kernel supply chain. Um, if your strategy is to only buy RSPO certified products, then we know there's a problem with um, the amount of kernel that is certified. Um, some Buyers who buy kernel from Malaysia struggle because some of these sort of mid-level kernel crushes have been quite resistant to um, sort of getting involved in the discussion and, and fully complying with NDPE um, because there's a lot of supply and there's lots of people, there's lots of people they can buy from, there's lots of people they can supply to who don't have NDP policies. And there has been a more of a challenge in the kernel supply chain. Um, than there has been in the crew, and that, that affects downstream companies that are only really buying kernel. You have, a, I say, a lack of will in comparison to midstream players, and perhaps that's a little bit unfair, but there's definitely been a focus on the midstream. You know, when you think of uh, when the NDP policies came in, it was Wilma most famously, and then it really started to take hold in the midstream section. So the trader refiners, and they were the ones that were really being pushed by the NGOs and by stakeholders to screen supply chains and invest in a lot of these sustainability projects and, and invest in landscape projects. And although the downstream companies were often targeted by the NGOs because they were the most visible um, end user, they weren't really involved in the discussion so much. So recently, it's, it's been, there's been more of a theme of bringing the consumer goods companies up to where the midstream players are. So you've seen like the RSPO have had the issue of shared responsibility and some of their um, conferences and roundtables. Um, so that's been a challenge. And one of the biggest challenges, um, which is a, perhaps evidence of the lack of will or because of these complex supply chains, but the supply list and the public data that you're relying on when you're dealing with consumer goods companies is often out of date. Um, so a lot of the companies will have supply lists from 2018, some 2019, but they won't be um, released as frequently as they will be with the midstream companies, the direct buyers. So you can be talking about a company that might be in the supply chain of a consumer goods company, but you don't really know if it's still in the supply chain because the, the public data that they're using is 
one or two years out of date. Um, so they need to be a little bit um, released more frequently, but it, it is a challenge because if you're not buying directly, you're relying on your intermediary trader to give you the supply chain information, and then you've got to do your own verification and then try and release it on time. So there are challenges that make um, enforcing sustainability policies quite difficult for these consumer mm -hmm. companies. Um, and Harad is going to uh, raise some of these challenges and, and some of the issues where companies are falling short. So I will pass you over to Harad now, and he will uh, discuss. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, well, there are four important KPIs to reduce risk and to, and to protect the reputation of fast moving consumer companies. And these four uh, KPIs, they came from interviews with investors and experts in NDPE execution in the palm oil chain. Um, and um, uh, the four are uh, as follows. Um, um, is there an NDP policy? Yes or no? Um, and the second one is, is there transparency of an up-to-date supplier palm oil list? Uh, Chris just talked about it. And is there a grievance list or a grievance process? Um, and we have taken a look, okay, which companies have a, have, have a new updated palm oil list, uh, supply list every half year. That's where we have taken a look at as an uh, as an uh, as an important point. Um, and uh, is there a grievance list? Uh, the third important point is um, is there a third party um, external auditing instrument? And the instruments that can be used um, that is regular site visits and landscape verification. And finally. Um, the fourth K KPI, the non-financial reporting. And th this is very important uh, because if a company uses TCFD uh, process or they reply to the CDP forest request, then you know that the company is, uh, that the process of thinking about uh, deforestation, the risks, uh, the costs is embedded in an organization. So, what is the outcome of this? Uh, of the of for the top twenty-five companies uh, regarding this for uh, KPIs. Next slide, please. Well, this is a fantastic uh, picture made by Ender. Um, and what does it do, what does it show? It's um, it shows that uh, it's it's only focused on one and two. Uh, on KPIs one and two, the biggest part is yellow. It's uh, and that mean and that is 88% of the companies is lagging in NDPE execution, and that's of the top 25 palm oil sourcing company, fast moving consumer good companies, which use 9% of the global palm oil production. Most of these companies are uh, publicly listed. We see uh, three of them which have uh, Hershey, Unigra and Unilever have, uh, have a good position. Uh, two of them uh, in the first two KPIs zero uh, and 88% it's, uh, it's lagging in NDPE execution. Um, of these 88%, uh, many also have a low or no CDP4 scores. They don't reply, or they have a very low, or they, they have a low score, uh, or they have weak external auditing processes, or they don't have a TCFD methodology. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, what are the costs of setting up such a, uh, a better execution and a better monitoring and verification system? And if you look to the various steps, and this is in line with that OECD approach, if you look to internal auditing, what does that cost? And yeah, we also take here into account the, what the costs are for the financial auditing. That is what every company has, financial auditing. 
but how, how about this non-financial auditing? Well, internal auditing that can cost 10,000 US dollars or maybe several hundred thousand, dependent on how big uh, a company is. If you look to external auditing, um, well, that might be, let's say, the same amount, 10,000 to maybe several hundred of thousand, depends on, on the size. Um, monitoring by third parties, um, uh, that might be tens of thousands to one million US dollar. Um, if that is expanded to on-site investigation, yeah, that becomes more expensive. Then you have to send people into the countries, uh, into the plantations. There are many plantations. Companies have many um, li uh, links and indirect links with many, many uh, uh, plantations. So that can cost tens of millions of US dollars. However, there are also elements that can reduce costs, and that is blockchain and other technology. So it's not well, IT because of IT is not it, it's not so expensive anymore as it was ten years ago. Um, and then you have uh, RSPO certification. If you look to the costs for that, on average, uh, the, let's say that's around thirty US dollar per per, per ton. So um, next slide, please. If you look to the uh, to the current uh, situation of the companies, what the, the cost of response in the in 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 in, in palm oil, and th these are answers given in by in in their CDP forest reply. So many companies don't reply on the requests and. Uh, this is a selection, not even a selection. These are all the companies in that top 25 which have replied with numbers. Um, and they are, uh, the questions are there from CDP, but the answers are quite uh, free. Uh, the, the, there, is, there is not a standardization of answers. And so therefore there is not a, not completely comparable the outcomes are not completely comparable and they lack they also lack transparency if you look to unilever um they have the highest cost of response it's 66 million um and that uh, that includes also the purchase of certified materials well as i already uh, showed that is around 30 us dollars per ton currently so that's nearly half of the costs are uh, from paying a bit extra on uh, on uh, on uh, fruit palm oil, um, and furthermore, it is it's mainly about the, their expenditures and investments in the programs throughout their supply chain. Um, we can see that, and so that that results in 64 euro, uh, US dollars per ton, and that's something that we will take as uh, a benchmark and as a best uh, best in class approach also because Unilever has the highest exposure and we know that Unilever uh, well they are well known for their uh, uh, above average uh, palm oil uh, policy execution strategy um, we see that Mars and L'Oreal spent much more per ton but that this is about 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 other def definitions now, L'Oreal's cost of response includes the total cost, for instance, of the sustainable sourcing. Um, if we would uh, take out the uh, the uh, the outlier L'Oreal, we would come for, on average, for this group of companies to 48 US dollars per ton. So not 80, but but 48. Um, next slide, please. Well, if we go to a best-in-class uh, uh, approach, uh, then um, um, we apply the 65 US dollar per ton to every company. So we have taken a look, okay, how much are they uh, and how much palm oil kernel and derivatives are they 
uh, sourcing that's based on WWF data. And um, what would be the execution cost? Well, the execution cost for this group of companies, which is replying to with numbers to GDP, is 130 million US dollars. That would be the best in class expenditure approach in execution, in monitoring, and in verification versus the current profitability. And then we take here the EBDA, earnings before interest, tax and depreciation and amortization, often used by the financial world. Then this 113 million US dollar is 0.3% of their total EBDA. However, if we move to, if we, if we compare this to the EBDA of the palm oil related products, um, then of course the percentage, which is only a part of the company's uh, sales in this, uh, for, for, for all the companies, then the execution cost for, for the palm oil uh, um, execution verification is around 0.9% compared to their EBDA from palm oil related products. So this is not still not an enormous number for this top 20 uh, for for this for for this group of of uh, of fast moving consumer good companies uh, and 0.9 percent yeah maybe it can be passed on via higher sales price i come back to that in a case study um next slide please this is the case study uh, it's a case study on Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble stated that 20 to 40% of revenues, of their revenues, is dependent on palm oil. 20 to 40%. That is not really a low percentage. So in many products, palm oil, uh, which is probably also the only controversial product in, the, in those products, yeah, except of course for fossil fuels, um, which is a major part of packaging, of, uh, of uh, also of shampoos, etc. But uh, palm oil is 20, is, 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 is 20 to 40 percent of the revenues is dependent on palm oil. And with this number, we started to calculate how much this would mean in sales price, in retail price, etc. Well, we know the numbers of, uh, of, uh, of Procter & Gamble. We know their total palm oil purchases, the costs. Uh, we have a benchmark of 65 per ton, uh, and we had come to 30 million, as you can see in the right hand, uh, right uh, column, most right. Um, and then you can compare that to, okay, the palm oil related products that is uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the raw material cost, it's uh, it's seven billion, et cetera, et cetera. You can count it to the total net net revenues, and then you arrive that this number is around 0.15 of the percentage of net revenues of the palm oil related products, and it's 0.12 percent of the retail value. So these are enormous low numbers. Um, and if you, if what, what would this, what would this mean if you, uh, if you have a best-in-class palm oil uh, policy execution verification policy at Procter and Gamble? It would mean that that bottle at the right hand, the head and shoulders, it's one of their famous products, that that uh, shampoo price would increase from, uh, let's say, uh, three U.S. dollars to Yes, exactly. It's only three US dollars. So you would see nearly no change in the price of the product if this company would move to a best in class uh, execution. It also shows, of course, how much value the, 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 the position of Procter Gamble in the value chain of palm oil. Next slide, please. Now, why are these, these companies spending so little? Uh, that's an important uh, question. Um, 
fast moving consumer goods own assessment of financial impact is is that underestimating uh, the the impact um, well also from the cdp uh, we get numbers of how uh, fast moving consumer goods estimate a potential negative uh, impact value impact from a weak NDPE policy execution. Well, and also here there are quite, uh, the, the outcomes are not completely comparable. They all use different uh, things. And we see that uh, Mars is one of the, is nearly an outlier here. Uh, they, uh, they take into account one, uh, uh, one billion, uh, one billion impact, but that is about only about that's about their European position. It's only about Europe, and they, uh, as the European consumers, are most sensitive to sustainability concerns. Mars added here. Uh, Unilever sees an impact which is very small, for instance, from 108 to 182 million, and that's based only based on an assumption that they might lose three to 5% of their sales. Um, however, that, is, that seems to be a very low number compared to Procter & Gamble. And uh, we think that they are underestimating their own sales uh, in which palm oil is included. Um, and I think that's the most important, what I mentioned here on the sheet. Yes. Uh, the, what, what I should mention also here is, is that the companies, these companies estimate uh, the, the, the total outcome uh, of uh, 800 million, excluding Mars, uh, is 0.4% of their total sales, 0.4% only. So that seems a bit of a low number. Um, next slide, please. So is there a misperception by fast moving consumer goods that they are spending so less and are they um, uh, estimating the risks uh, on the right uh, on the right level? Well, uh, if you that the, the, the reputation risk is dominates for fast moving consumer goods companies. Uh, in the whole deforestation chain, fast moving consumer goods companies are not really facing physical risks or uh, stranded asset risk, I mean, or um, market access risk, yeah, maybe a bit. Uh, financing risk, they often have strong balance sheets, so there's also not there a big issue. No, it's mainly reputation risk, which uh, which they are facing. And, uh, well, we, we have calculated here in four different ways. The first column, uh, we have calculated it based on the report which we issued last year on deforestation driven reputation risk could become material for fast moving consumer goods where the outcome was that it could uh, uh, that, that, that the value of companies could be impacted by a bad uh, execution communication on ESG issues by around 30 percent uh, the second column is based on uh, PE earnings and on relative PE earnings, how much value at risk do they face if it goes to a five year um, um, a level, um, average level? Um, and um, well, column three and four are refinements of these methodologies. And yeah, probably the outcome that we that that's most probable at this moment is that the 16 to 82 billion outcome and that's th three to five 15 percent of the current value of this group of uh, of companies and um, um, this valuation this this poll this this reputation risk could escalate to a company-wide reputation risk and that is the bigger number that's the 167 billion which is 30 percent of their current value and well, that might happen when uh, the atten when there is some further accelerating, escalating attention from NGOs, public uh, retailers, investors, but also the regulatory framework. We know from the European Union that there can be legal consequences um, if the uh, 
um, in the if if deforestation uh, is in the supply chain. So that is quite new, but it can can be quite can be quite become quite big legal uh, effects. So in total, so, but for now on, we we go for three to fifteen percent of the current shareholders' value is at risk, and that number of sixteen to eighty two billion. It is nine to 45 times larger than the uh, uh, than the estimates by the uh, by the fast move, by, by the own estimates of the fast moving consumer good companies of the of the costs that they, they are facing. So that's a big number. Next next slide, please. Well, this very short on this one. This one gives for every company a company assessment. Uh, the red line. And our uh, outcomes on reputation risk, our various scenarios on reputation risk. Well, for all companies, the outcomes are substantial. The, the outcomes for, for, for reputation risk are substantially ahead of the own company um, assessments. Next slide, please. Well, good. Fast moving consumer goods in this context, could they solve the small upcoming smallholders problem? Well, properly uh, they can. If we if we take a look at the numbers again, and we just have looked at the eight to nine which have reported in a CDP format with the numbers. But if we uh, apply this to the top 25 fast moving consumer good companies, and then take a look at the numbers. Best in class NDP execution spending, right? not 130 million, but for the top 25, 339 million. Um, and the, uh, the DCF value of this is 3.4 billion. If you look to the reputation risk, uh, that will also be around three times. And that means that uh, this range can go up from, of, from to, to 49 to 245 uh, billion. And if we look to the palm oil related EBDA, that's not really three times. So not everybody is earning the same margins as Procter and Gamble. Uh, but yeah, we probably it will be in the range of 20 to 30 billion of palm oil related EBDA, which is generated by the top 25 fast moving consumer good companies, which use around 9% of the global palm oil production. Now, what's the context concerning the smallholders? Well, the smallholders they are facing after 25 years of strong palm oil production growth, these trees get an age of around 25 years. So they are facing currently a big upcoming replanting process and high costs. And because of the, let's say the poverty in that, uh, in that part of the chain, there is an increased risk of, uh, of deforestation. Uh, the numbers for this are calculated in the CR report. Uh, uh, future small deforestation, possible palm oil risk. And for the, the, the total renewal cost for the coming five years, 25 years, will be around 20, 28 billion US dollars. And that means 1.1 billion per year and if we uh, currently these costs uh, uh, for a solution of this dilemma are mainly borne by by smallholders governments it's the subsidies for uh, on on the rent on 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 on, uh, on interest rates to to smallholders uh, indonesian government for instance indonesian banks uh, large plantation companies try to support smallholders but they are also externalized, and that is just through de uh, deforestation. So then the environment is paying for it. Uh, while the fast moving consumer goods companies occasionally they participate in, in a project. Well, um, it, it, it means that um, this what, what you have to see this context 1.1 billion replanting costs that is around 3.7 to 5.5 percent of the top 25 fast moving consumer good palm oil related EBITDA. So that is 
versus the three to 15%, maybe even 30% reputation uh, risk, that is, uh, uh, that is a relatively small percentage. Next slide, please. So, uh, conclusions of the of the of, of this of this report and of this presentation: eighty-eight percent of the top twenty-five fast-moving consumer co good companies still lagging in NDP execution. Um, the, uh, we have uh, we have uh, distinguished four key performance KPIs. They can help to measure the, the, the leakage risk. Helpful for investors. Helpful for companies. Um, for fast moving consumer could come at best in class is, uh, is quite a low cost burden. Yeah, we calculated it that would be below 1% of, uh, of EBDA and around uh, nearly 0% of the palm oil related product revenues. Um, well, the reason that fast moving consumer good companies do not spend more, it might be lack of knowledge, but it might also be a misperception of their of the fun, of the financial impact of the financial risk um, and that is not 1.8 billion uh, it's probably much more to 16 to 82 billion or it might even move to uh, 167 but that's only for the top eight top nine for the bigger group of course for the group of 25 it's much more it's three to 15 percent of the equity values so uh, investors they uh, they might have ample financial reason to engage with fast-moving consumer good companies to work on this issue um, and um, well i uh, with this i like to hand back to matt thank you thank you Gerard and chris uh, for that great presentation we'll now move to the q a if you have any please type them into the q a function we already have a large number of questions and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, the, the first one, um, you, you touched on this a bit. Uh, could you explain how we track palm oil moving from plantations to consumer product companies and uh, why can't retail companies do this? Yeah. Um, so you need your, first of all, you need your concession. So concession databases, um, we have a concession database that comes from a variety of sources. So governments will often um, make the concession data available um, from RSPO documents, from annual reports, from environmental impact assessments, a variety of sources. But if you've got your concession and you've got your mills and you know then who owns, these concessions, which you can find out um, from public um, notary acts, um, and then just research, you can find out who owns the concessions and which corporate groups they're from. You then monitor deforestation and over the deforestation data with the concession database to work out who's responsible for the deforestation. And then from these public supply lists, you can just basically follow the supply chain. So the trader refiners. Um, We've analysed that about 83% of the refining capacity in Indonesia and Malaysia is covered by um, NDP policy, so public supply lists. And if you think Indonesia and Malaysia are responsible for about half of refining in the world, so that's a large amount of um, refining capacity covered by this. So you can see who the buyer is, um, where this palm oil is going, and follow it from upstream, midstream to downstream. Of course, you're relying on downstream companies to have public supply lists. Um, so you, if they do, you can link it along the supply chain. If they don't, it's a lot harder. You can sometimes um, access trade data, which will give you that information. Um, but often you reach a dead end at some point because the transparency just disappears. So you're relying very much on companies disclosing themselves who they're buying from. Um, and why can't retail companies do this? Uh, they can. It just requires amendment of transparency and investment. Um, it's hard. Like it's you know anyone who deals with supply chains knows how complex it is, and it's covering multiple jurisdictions and geographies. So it's challenging, but you just you have to invest in it. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next question is: Could you explain what a grievance list is and how it works? 
Um, I can do that. Yeah, a grievance list would be um, a mechanism through which um, people can complain, make a complaint about um, your company. So you could have an internal grievance list, which is where staff can raise issues and then those grievances, complaints are kept somewhere. Um, in the context of NDPE, it's a public um, list where any cases of non-compliance are logged and tracked and um, where external you know, stakeholders or independent observers can access that grievance list and see which cases you're, you're aware of, which ones you're monitoring and the status of each complaint. So if I, if I want to know if um, Simon Darby, for example, um, are aware of a case in their supply chain, I can go onto their website and I can access their grievance list. And on that grievance list, I will find a list of all the cases that they're aware of, what they're dealing with them, and like the latest um, updates for them. It's really key to see so you know what companies are doing and how, how they're monitoring their supply chains and how seriously they're taking it. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, next question, with regards to consumer awareness that's driving the reputational risk, what evidence do we have on consumer choices? Are they in fact choosing to buy Palm, palm Tree products? Um, you, your question was about palm oil free products? Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, well, of course, there are f in, 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 in various countries, there are many, uh, many, uh, re many researches done on, um, on consumer reactions on ESC type events. And um, the reactions of consumers are um, not, 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 there, there is a high awareness but the real impact on the revenue level and the sales level is still relatively low. If you look to where, what the model in, in, the, in, in the CDP questionnaire that Unilever is, uh, is answering on, what is the risk uh, of, uh, of, 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 of a weak uh, NDP policy? How will uh, consumers react? They have two scenarios, 3% three, three and 5%. So that are quite limited, uh, limited reactions. So um, uh, much more important in the whole reputation, uh, in the rep reputation issue is how investors are reacting on companies in their portfolio, uh, which still have links with deforestation in palm oil or in soy, or in meat, that's where the big uh, value change is happening. It's not really yet so much happening in the sales line of the numbers. It's much more happening in the value, in the equity value, in the enterprise value of companies. Which uh, brings up a broad, uh, broader question that um, an attendee had. Are FMGC FMCG companies and their products incompatible with the climate and biodiversity emergencies as their prices don't reflect ESG costs? Um, no, the, the, the prices don't reflect um, um, ESG, uh, ESG, external cost. No external penalties are taken into account in, in, in the prices. So uh, yeah, there is, there is quite there's, there is an issue there, and of course, it's that is not that is not optimal. That is uh, uh, that is completely true. Great, uh, thanks, Gerard. Uh, next question um, about um, FMCG companies mentioned they still get linked to deforestation despite spending millions on NDPE execution. Uh, do you agree that these companies should start sourcing from RSPO certified um, palm oil instead to delink themselves from deforestation and rogue companies? Yeah, I think uh, Chris can answer much better on this than, than I do, but there are in the market, there are many, many questions and may also many uh, examples 
that RSPO is not uh, a guarantee. Uh, it's not a it's not a guarantee for no deforestation. But uh, uh, Chris can uh, can answer on this. Um, yeah, possibly. It's a strategy that some companies have taken. I think Ferrero is the most well known. They only buy an RSPO segregated supply chain. You need to know who you're buying from, um, basically. Um, and it, ideally from plantation to where you've picked it up, there will be challenges along that supply chain. Um, if you're buying indirectly and you're not buying a segregated supply, then you're exposed, you know, you're exposed to everything that that intermediary trader buys from. So you need to, you need to know who you're buying from. So a segregated supply is the best way to do that, whether it's RSPO, um, or it's just a uh, segregated supply chain that you have negotiated with your intermediary traders. You know, it can be either one, um, but you need to know who you're buying from. Who you're buying from. Um, if you don't have full traceability to plantation, at least sort of the landscape that you're sourcing from, so you sort of know what the risks are. Um, another option that some companies have done to mitigate risk is to sort of geo-block or buy from quite restricted areas. So some of the traders in Malaysia will have a, will only directly source from a couple of states in Peninsula Malaysia, or they won't buy from Sarawak because they know that there's a risk of deforestation in that state, or they won't buy from a particular landscape, like the Loza ecosystem in Sumatra, people will say, companies will say it's too much of a risk, so we're sort of excluding that area from our supply base. Um, you know, you've still got risk, it's not ideal, but it's, uh, it's a layer of transparency or sort of a segregation um, that they consider a way to reduce risk. Um, so it's difficult to say, you know, as Harad says, it, RSPO is, is not perfect, but I think a segregated supply chain is probably the best bet that you want to remove risk from your supply chain. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, one question about um, methodology regarding uh, deforestation defined in the um, early in the presentation, like in Q1 and Q2 for 2020. Could you explain um, how that's defined by CRR? Um, yes, high carbon stock. The palm oil industry has pretty much adopted high carbon stock methodology. And high carbon stock methodology includes high conservation value methodology. Well, they, they work pretty much in tandem. So we use high carbon stock. So we use um, forest layers, primary, secondary, um, whatever you can get depending on the area you're looking at, and peat layers. And we overlay it and then make an assessment based on the HCS categories. Of course, it needs further assessment. You know, if you if you went down to the ground, you might find that some of the peat areas were not in fact peat, or some areas that weren't that aren't on the peat layers are actually peat because it's a complex, but um, it's a pretty good indicator, and the industry has accepted HCS methodology, so it's quite good because we have this recognized standard that we can apply. And the industry accepts it. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, next question for Harard. Could you explain how inv investors are pushing companies on the deforestation issue? Um, yes, they are. Um, investors are um, engaging with companies uh, by, well, using material like the chain reaction research uh, reports. They are. Um, using this kind of reports to, uh, to, 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 to set up a discussion with companies about um, their links to, to deforestation. And what we in particular also try to make transparent today uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation is also that there might be, uh, that there might be more, um, that, that, that also the discussions about uh, the four KPIs, for instance, um, and about maybe a, a larger involvement in um, in cooperation with other uh, uh, with other uh, participants, stakeholders in the chain, um, 
in order to 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 to, to reduce the risk of deforestation. So um, yeah, that's how investors are um, um, are uh, engaging with 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 companies on this uh, issue of deforestation. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Gerard. We have uh, time for about a couple more questions. One is about a Mars new strategy. They've um, r radically shortened its palm oil supply chain to just a few large industrial plantations. Uh, do you think that strategy could be successful or replicated by others? Yeah, and, um, maybe also Chris uh, wants to answer on this. And uh, I know also from other companies, uh, that they are looking for a uh, radical uh, uh, reduction in the number of plantations that they are sourcing from in order to get a better view on um, on where the palm oil is uh, is coming from. I know L'Oreal has communicated on this. Uh, Unilever has communicated on this. Um, However, there are of course problems. Is that 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 palm oil mills are sourcing from many many uh, small plantations, and small holders are very very small. Uh, so uh, there is there is an issue in uh, it's it, it's good to to let's say to consolidate to get a better control. That's very, quite normal in the whole fast moving consumer supply chain, or also for other uh, ingredients um and uh, and supplies uh but whether it will work very quickly and good for uh for in this way this methodology for palm oil in indonesia i don't know uh, chris uh yeah i mean yeah you've covered a lot of the issues it's it works for a company like mars i think and it's yeah, but it doesn't if it's replicated by lots of companies you'll quickly come up against capacity issues because the public will want to buy from the same companies and then there's questions about what happens to these um, companies that are excluded from supply chains and where will they end up selling to and you just increase these leakage markets. Um, it doesn't also address, you know, the conversation that's happening at the moment is what do you do about these um, companies that have deforested in the last few years that are being excluded from supply chains like how do you get them back in how do you recover these wider areas um, and that's something that mars will have to address as well because um, that's the discussion that's being had the ngos are talking about compensation and um, recovery RSP has the compensation mechanism so it's not it's i can understand why mars have done it you know it's probably for them it's a good idea but it I think that for the industry, it's not the answer, and it, there's a discussion that's happening at the same time about um, compensation that Mars will have to be involved in because everyone will. So um, it's maybe one solution in specific circumstances, but um, I don't think it's the answer to all, all the problems in the industry. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, our last question, um, what would be the best way for FMCGs to invest in smallholder farmers? Should they bypass trading companies and directly source from, from them? Um, yeah, uh, Chris, do you have a uh, good answer on that? Uh, oh, not really, that's a very difficult question. Uh, no, it's, oh, well. Oh, it's, maybe, yeah it would be it's so cultural as well like smallholders and the issues are not the same in every place that you buy from so i think you need you need to use the mechanisms that have been set up within different jurisdictions for smallholders um and engage with communities with people representing communities with cso's that work in those particular areas um it's there's no like one size fits all answer to that because it, it's so complicated when you're dealing with different cultural issues. Um, but I, I would, well, I, yeah, I think there are mechanisms in place to assist smallholders, and you should always use them. Yeah, and and with my with with, with the last page that uh, that I presented, I uh, I said, well, there is twenty to thirty billion of EBITDA uh, in the top twenty five 
fast moving consumer good palm oil users, which can be, let's say, partly used to give a bit more of uh, uh, cash flow available to make the easy transitions. And yeah, it's it's nowadays quite easy to um, to communicate about this kind of issue issues and probably the European uh, competition uh, commission will not say uh, committee will not say that it is not allowed to discuss this with the top 25 to improve uh, the cash flow opportunities to the smallholders industry and that would cost fast moving consumer good companies only a very low percentage so the money is there uh, it only needs to be executed and a Zoom meeting nowadays can also be on a five by five uh, number of uh, photographs. So um, execution uh, can start quite easily. Great, thanks Gerard. Uh, we're coming up on the hour now. So um, that's the end of our event today. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions. Uh, feel free to follow up with any of us today. Um, thanks for joining the presentation.